Good morning. morning. How are you? It is good to be with people who want to learn. This morning, we're going to talk about trends, kind of what's been going on in the past and now and in the future with brain technology. Do you have a brain? Did you bring it with you this morning? You know, it's really always with you. It's involved in everything that you do, everything that you think, everything that you feel, everything that you say, everything that you sense, perceive, imagine, fear is in your brain. Some people say it would be in your mind. Some people say that the brain is an architecture, a framework that underpins the mind. Today we will mostly be speaking about the organ that is your brain, but make no mistake about it, your mind is close by. Now, I'm pretty excited to talk about brain technology, and I think when we think about the brain and we think about technology, there's an intersection there, and it's pretty intriguing, don't you think? But it's also very complex. The brain, in fact, is a complex adaptive system. So is technology, especially when it is connected to things like the internet or some intelligent background that's running it. So when we have two complex adaptive systems, we have a lot of complexity. And that complexity is very difficult to know. In fact, I, I think uh, it's important for us to keep that in mind as we discuss this topic. Sometimes we can speak about it as if we're confident in it. But man has a habit of being confident in his ignorance and repeating that over and over. There's nothing wrong with that as long as we use those periods to learn. So we have a caution to lay out in front of us about what we know about the brain and about what we know about technology. Now, this complexity can be daunting, but it doesn't have to overwhelm us. It doesn't have to overwhelm us at all. In fact, if we think about that complexity in and of itself, then we will be overwhelmed. But if we think about deeper things, things that are really not technical, we can get clarity. Things like friends, having people with you. Things like faith, knowing what you believe in and what the principles of life really are for you. Knowing what it is that is valuable is critical. If you don't recognize value, it's very hard for your brain to make a decision. How can technology assist your brain if there is no value structure? By, by what rules, by what premise would you make decisions? It's critical that as we face the very difficult questions that will come to us because of brain technology, that we consider faith, that we consider friends, the people with us, how we're connected to them, and what that means for our future. Now, we can deal with some of that complexity through these questions of faith, really having a good feel for our faith, a good grounding, a standing on the rock, if you will. But I'd like to start today in dealing with that complexity with you. Who are you? What are you? Does anybody here have maybe some metal that has been implanted in your body to help your spine or another part? Do you have a pacemaker? Maybe you have a deep brain stimulator. Maybe you have a patch that's giving you some medication. Maybe you have medication surging through your blood, making its way into your tissues and into your brain and affecting your thoughts. So are you all you, entirely you, or are you a mix of technology and you? It's a great question, don't you think? Now, maybe it could be more obvious for us that we're a mix between technology and ourselves. 
But I want to push on some notions today and, and hopefully kind of expand our thinking about what technology is, what brain technology really is. Some people say that it is an underlying architecture for learning, a kind of map. But I'd like to push on that a little. There's really biotechnology, some interface between an inanimate machine, some computative technology and us, neurotechnology to deal with our, our brain, and nanotechnology, particles smaller than an atom. Mm, I don't know if you've seen Neuralink. I don't know if you've seen Neurodust something called sim dust, very tiny particles that can be placed in your body, float in your body, target an area of your body and be signaled from outside your body. And when they are signaled, they then influence things like neurons, brain cells, to cause changes in your brain. So it could be obvious, like the picture that you see, but it could be less obvious. That's the one I want to push on today. And to do so, I'd like to to go to some work by Kevin Warwick. Dr. Warwick is at the University of Reading in England, and I'd just like to look at a little bit of the work that he's done and let this extend our thinking today. Well, here at the University of Reading, what we've created is a robot with a biological brain. This is a brain where the neurons are cultured, are grown under laboratory conditions, so that the only control of a physical robot is this biological brain that we have grown. Did you catch that? He said the, the brain that they have grown. Now you're growing a brain today. In fact, your experience is altering the connections within your brain. And we'll talk more about that later, but he has grown a brain. And this has been done in other labs as well, but not exactly in the same way. And what they have done is to culture brain cells today as we speak, they're teaching that culture of brain cells, and it is learning. Now, that's brain technology. And it's something that could evolve into a connection between that brain tissue and a robot. And that's what you see playing in front of you. A robot with a grown biological brain operating it. It has sensors. It can learn which way to go. It can learn a path. This is, in essence, a cyborg. It's not something that is far into the future. It's not something that is coming. It's here. You just saw it. And guess what? This is not brand new. There are other people who have built upon this work. And so when we ask that question about who you are and what you are, it's a deep question. We cannot deal with brain technology without dealing with these deeper questions, and we cannot answer those deeper questions without having an idea, uh, a connection to other people, friends, and a connection within ourselves that's also connected to God through our faith. And it is only through that connection that we can answer what we are, who we are, what we should do. What should we do with this brain technology that is advancing faster than we know what to do with it? Sometimes we develop technology and sometimes we do that intentionally for a purpose. We see a need and we develop the technology and at other times what we're really doing is taking the technology that's been developed and figuring out is there, if there is a need for it. And it's okay to be in either mode, but both of those things are driving us forward with great speed. If you took all of the information, all of the data, all of the, the printed word, all of the knowledge, I'll use that word, all of the knowledge that the world had up until about 2010, we'll call that X, <laughs> X knowledge. Between 2010 and about 2012, we had two X. Information, knowledge, technology is bringing us speed and volume. And so not only is the speed of technology and the speed of the amount of information increasing, but the speed of thought must increase in order to process that information. Choosing which information to use and where to use it requires a good connection to a set of values. BrainGate gave us a 
an insight into the brain in about 2005, and you see that on your left. Kind of invasive, don't you think? And that technology allowed us to have a brain-computer interface, a brain-machine interface, human-machine interface. That interface in 2015 looked like the picture on the right. It was much smaller and actually does about the same thing, maybe a little better, in terms of reading the brain and sensing the brain. Now, I want to ask you this question. Does the technology have to be wired to you and connected to you to be in you? to affect you. There is this natural attraction in a child's brain for the speed and the allure of technology. Maybe the seduction of technology affects all of us. I simply want you to ask, when you are seduced by technology, or when you are repulsed by technology, and both may occur in any given day for you, I want to ask, how are you deciding if that technology that is connected to your brain, is it actually giving you value? How will you decide that without knowing what your set of principles for decision making really is? Now, this is an incredible piece of technology itself. Or is it real? What do you think? Is it a real eye that we are looking at? Or is it something that is artificial? Google's DeepMind used uh, an algorithm uh, called BigGAN to develop uh, a number of uh, images. And then they asked people if they thought they were real or not. And most people couldn't tell the difference. You see, technology has a tendency to blur what's real and what's not. Who we are and who we are not. It has a tendency to blend things together to blur them at a high rate of speed and with great volume. And that can be hard for us to manage. We must have an idea of how to move forward in our future using this technology to bring value to us. And we must have an idea to do that that is for good. So it really is in this connection with friends and with faith that we're able to make the best decisions about brain technology. I want you to know that brain technology is going to be pushing on us with greater speed and greater pressure than ever before. And the blurring of lines is going to occur at a rate that we have never seen before. Recently, three brains were connected. They could not see each other. They could not speak with one another. And those three people were connected, in this case, by a wire using electroencephalogram and then a transcranial uh, stimulator, magnetic stimulator. And the loop that was created between those technologies was able to transfer thought from one brain to another brain to another brain. Now, it's a short step from wired to wireless. The wireless transmission of thought is an incredibly exciting thing. It's also an incredibly horrifying thing. Because I can see, I really don't want to know what some of you are thinking. <laughs> On the other hand, there are some of you that I would really like to know what you're thinking. Think about the implications of that for communication and connectedness between friends in our communities. Now, this diffusion tensor image that you're looking at now is really highlighting the connections within the brain. These are very poorly understood. We see some of these as literally feet long. And the colors that you see represent different orientation of those fibers. And we say, oh, well, this is a brain, and it looks like other brains. No. Remember I said a little while ago that your experience changes the connections in your brain. Every experience you have, and remember experience is comprised of your thinking and what you do and what you say and how you feel. Most of your experience happens within you, not outside of you. And that experience changes your brain. And it changes it almost instantly by changing the connections in your brain. 
This is a picture of what some of the, the white matter, some of the longer connections in the brain look like. But they're very complex. At the same time that we are doing this, we are concentrating in a very precise way on the brain. In fact, today, neural arrays can sense one neuron. And in your brain, there are maybe 100 billion neurons, each of them connected to thousands of other neurons for a total of about, and the guy's still in the back room counting, but it looks like around 160 trillion. That's a lot of connections. And remember that those connections are changing moment by moment, and they're exactly unique to you. There has only been one of you, and there will never be another one of you, and that is true of your brain. It is a one of a kind, a great gift. Now, I want you to think about what we want from technology then. What is the experience that we're looking for from technology, brain technology? What, what are we looking for it to do for us? Because the experience that it gives us will be a part of what it ends up impacting us uh, as in terms of the, the outcome. That technology has to be looked at in terms of the experience it's giving us. Is it augmented reality, virtual reality, reality, reality? What is it that we want in terms of the experience from the brain technology? We must answer that question. We're going to go to our last slide now because it's very, very important. And the last slide gives us the answer to the complexity of the brain and how to use the brain technology that is flowing over us at a great speed and with great volume. But I am going to tell you that instead of a baby crawling up on a keyboard, if we see more babies doing this, more children doing this, we'll have a better idea about how to make decisions that connect us to friends, that build our faith, and that allow us to use brain technology to build a better future for us. Thank you.